Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar titled Made in Italy, the world of fashion from World War II to today. I'm very uh, pleased to be here and really happy to have uh, our guest, Sarah Fordern, and this event will be um, co-hosted, co-presented by uh, me and uh, Donatella Melucci, teaching professor at Georgetown University, and uh, Professor Nicoletta Pireddu, a uh, professor in the Italian department, uh, a specialist in comparative literature, and inaugural director of Georgetown Humanities Initiatives. Uh, we are going to uh, today to talk about uh, uh, fashion, what happened to fashion, to Italian fashion uh, after World War II. And uh, uh, we welcome Sara K. Forden, and uh, I will uh, give a brief presentation of uh, Sara. There is a lot to say about her, but I will try to be very uh, concise. Uh, Sara Gay Forden is an author and journalist. She holds a master's degree from uh, Johns Hopkins University, SAIS, the School of Dance International Studies. Uh, and this uh, degree took her to Italy, uh, where uh, uh, she ended up being there for 22 years. Uh, she worked in uh, uh, Milan as a business correspondent and, and covered uh, the explosion of family-owned designer labels, including Giorgio Armani, uh, Prada, Gianni Versace. She published for uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the International Herald Tribune, uh, Women's Wear Daily, W Magazine, and uh, Bloomberg News. She's now based in DC, in Washington, DC, with Bloomberg News, where she leads a team of reporters uh, covering corporate influence in the nation's capital and the escalating uh, scrutiny uh, facing great, uh, giant technology companies such as uh, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Donatella, for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here with you all. I'm sorry, I couldn't say everything, but uh, at least we, we have an idea. Perfect. <laughs> okay. uh, so let's start. We have a lot to talk with Professor Piredu. Uh, so let's get uh, um, into this uh, webinar. Um, uh, so uh, we would like to get a, a basic an overview of uh, the Italian fashion industry after World War II. Uh, we know that before the war, uh, before World War II, the Italian fashion was not very famous. Uh, there was a big designer, it uh, was Elsa Schiaparelli, and there was basically the competitor of Coco Chanel. And I read somewhere that uh, Coco Chanel didn't even call it by a first name, she just said the Italian designer. Uh, um, and then we have uh, Le Sorelle Fontana, uh, which they started their business in, uh, in Rome in 1943. Uh, Gucci was already in business, Guccio Gucci was already in business. But during the war, as we read in your book, uh, he made boots for the soldiers. That was a way to keep the company in business. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, after, after World War II, because uh, uh, the American soldiers brought Italian products uh, to their homeland, uh, uh, the world, uh, not, only in, not only America, but in general, uh, started noticing the Italian fashion. So can you tell us more? So mine was a very, very short summary. Can you tell us more about the, Italian, the scenario of uh, the Italian fashion after World War II. Yes, absolutely. And that's a great recap. I think the thing to realize about where Italy was right after the war was that there was nothing. I mean, the country had been devastated. The factories had been converted to manufacture for the war. So there were no streets, there were no cars, you know, things had been bombed. And so it was, it was absolutely, and all you have to do is watch some of the old, you know, realist films um, from that era to see how, um, how tough things were. Um, and I think that, that one of the things that really helped the Italian fashion industry to rise out of that devastation of war was that um, it started, what, was, what started to be successful was based on craftsmanship. 
um, not on factories, because the factories were just starting to get, get started again. But, you know, you mentioned Gucci, Gucci, who had started his company. He had small leather goods products that he was able to sell to the soldiers who were leaving. So, you know, these were being made by hand in, in the workshop. Um, you have other, other kinds of crafts, um, but you didn't have a big fashion industry at the time. I mean, the, the whole couture, which as you said, was based in Rome, was, was based on the sarte, right? These were all hand sewn clothes. These were not clothes that, this was not preta porte. So I think that's, that's really the starting point. Um, and then what you see happening in Italy is a, a system of production that was very regional. So you had different areas of Italy that became strong in different kinds of products. So obviously the whole area around Tuscany, around Florence was, was very strong for leather goods, also because of the skins, but also for textiles. So, so you have the Prato region, which became, for example, known for denim, but also for its uh, ability to scrap you know, and to recycle old fabrics. Um, you have the area around Como that was uh, very strong in the silk production, um, the silk trade and the, the silk design. And then, and then also the stitching of silk, which is very different than stitching other kinds of fabrics. And then you have the area in Biella because of the water supply, which became very strong for the wool. And so, um, so what you see is almost like a regional, regionally based system that, that grew, you know, beyond the craftsmanship of the of the early early stages so i would say we see the evolution of of the fashion um, system going from really handmade goods to then the beginnings of very you know, specialized production okay great thank you um, um, actually i want to say one more thing about about the war and that um i think there's also real evidence of the creativity of Italians in times of crisis. And so, as I write in my book, um, even before the war, uh, Italy was hit with a, a pre-war trade embargo. So many of the, of the very specialized materials that they had been importing were not, no longer available. And that's actually what gave birth to the bamboo handle bag because bamboo was plentiful and it was cheap. And again, there were artisans and workmen who, who experimented with bending the bamboo you know, sticks over a flame and making it brown and making it supple and turning that into this handle, which became you know, still today, one of Gucci's iconic products. So you know, that just comes from ingenuity and workmanship. Um, a similar example to that is Ferragamo, who had also, um, he had come from Southern Italy, but he had settled also in the Florentine area in Tuscany. And they were experimenting with raffia, um, you know, the kind of straw products and, and weaving sandals out of raffia. And then also as sort of a light, you know, something fun and, and special, they would actually take old candy wrappers and twist them into the raffia to give a little sparkle. So this again is, is a testimony to the ingenuity of, of Italian um, craftsmen. Thank you. Yeah, what is a characteristic of Italian uh, um, artigianato, right? What we call artigianato. Uh, thank you. So uh, if we move uh, now from uh, uh, the end of the war into the 50s and the 60s, uh, and we know that in this uh, period, Italian, in Italian fashion became more prevalent, more prevalent uh, in Italy, in Europe, in the world. Uh, and this was uh, thanks to a businessman and entrepreneur, um, uh, Giovanni Battista, Battista Giorgini, who started the first fashion show, right? He did it in his house uh, in Florence, in, in Villa Torrigiani, uh, and uh, invited six major uh, American companies uh, to attend the event. So it was a fantastic su success. After that, there was the fashion show in Palazzo Pitti in Florence. Uh, and then in 1958, we had, um, there was the, the Milan Fashion Week that started in 1958. In the meanwhile, Aldo Gucci opened his first store in 1953 uh, in New York. Uh, and so it's, it's obvious that now the Italian fashion industry 
as uh, becoming what this doubt made in Italy. And also, is, I think that also Italian cinematography um, played a big role uh, by showing movies, like Fellini movies, La Dolce Vita. So everything that showed the Italian culture, maybe that made uh, uh, people, customers, uh, uh, fall in love with Italian fashion. What do you think about it? What is your perspective about it? So these are still very early days, but absolutely it was Giorgini who, who created the first, you know, Preta Pote shows. And um, it was very exclusive. It was very elegant. You know, he would show in this beautiful room with the chandelier. Um, it was very much modeled on the French um, couture shows. Um, but in those years, the fashion um, psyche was still very much dominated by the French labels and the Chanel and Dior and Yves Saint Laurent. So I think we saw like a budding group of, of designers in Italy and, and some of the uh, designers that ended up showing and becoming, you know, very powerful in Milan were already starting in the Sala Bianca um, with Giorgini. Um, but I think there wasn't a big, and, and, and the early, early um, brands that were present in New York were Gucci and Pucci. And so that almost became a jingle for the people, you know, who were shopping in New York. They knew Gucci and Pucci. They didn't know, you know, there was Missoni, there was Crizia, Ferre was starting, but uh, those names were not uh, as well known in those years because they didn't have a store in New York. And the American department stores were predominantly buying the French brands. Uh, and this was up even through into the 70s and 80s. They were still, uh, very focused on the French brands. And uh, one story that I love, uh, which is also in the book, is the story of Don Mello, who was the president of Bergdorf Goodman, um, which at the time was kind of a faded, faded department store. It needed dusting off, it needed refreshing. And she went in to, to turn it around. And she was a woman who had, you know, come to the sort of the heights of the American retail uh, market. And she was going to the French labels to try to buy them, to bring them into her store. And they wouldn't sell to her because they had signed exclusives with Neiman's and Saks and Macy's and Bloomingdale's. And so she had a real uh, problem. How was she going to attract you know, high level um, American customers into her store if she didn't have these brands? And so she tells about the story about how she actually started buying the Italians. And it was thanks to her that brands like Armani and Prada and Gucci started being present in a, you know, in a significant way in American department stores. Um, but that was actually many, many years later. And then, and then it became kind of her, her edge too, because she was developing these labels and these businesses that the other stores maybe didn't have in such a way. So. So, um, and that was sort of the precursor to her then going over to Gucci and, and helping Maurizio Gucci turn around the Gucci label. And that, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, thank you. Now, if we, so we looked at the 50s, the 60s, the 60s, now we go to the 70s, 70s, the end of the 60s and the 70s. Where, where uh, uh, fashion, in Italy becomes a marker of social innovation. Uh, and so it's not just clothes, apparel and accessories, it becomes more, it, it starts being more meaningful. Uh, if, for example, like you mentioned before, the pret a fashion became very popular uh, and uh, Giorgio Armani uh, became the face of gender equality uh, and refined glamour with its unstructured men's tailoring and heavily built uh, women's garment. What, what can you tell us about that period? Absolutely. I mean, I think Armani really was kind of a revolution in women's fashion. And, and even though Yves Saint Laurent had sort of put the pantsuit and the smoking, you know, out for women, it was really Armani that became kind of the the, the banner for the sophisticated American uh, and European working woman. And 
And there were many things about his clothes that, that worked for this professional woman. And one was that they were comfortable and there was a sense of ease. They weren't, you know, uptight or constricted. Um, the woman could come to a, a board meeting or, you know, a table and be, feel just as comfortable as the man, but not look like a man. You know, I don't know if you all remember, but in the 80s, there was just this real pressure for women in the workforce to feel and act like a man. And Armani kind of turned that into a different thing and he made it feminine and beautiful and soft. Uh, so it was almost that combination of, of being soft and feminine and powerful at the same time that, that was appealing. And I remember interviewing um, like women, you know, customers for stories for women's or daily. I think I got some Bergdorf's to give me some names of like big spenders. Um, and I remember one in particular told me she loved buying Armani because she could buy a few pieces like every season and they would all work together. So one of the things that Armani, you know, and this was a business strategy, but it was also a style. You could buy pieces from different collections and different seasons and wear them together and put them together and they would blend. So it wasn't like he was completely revolutionizing his style from season to season. And, and so it was that consistency in style that was appealing to his customers. So would you say, we remember the shoulder pads in the eighties, uh, right? That show women, yeah, uh, we, we remember that. Uh, so do you agree that, uh, that, uh, um, that these early, the eighties, seventies actually started, uh, were the beginning of a new role uh, of fashion in society? Absolutely. And it was really sort of fashion as also being an identifier as to kind of what kind of person you were, what, what your, you know, what your tribe was. Um, and it wasn't all Armani. I mean, I remember when I started covering uh, the Milan shows, there was a real face off between Armani and Versace. And so Armani was the king of beige and he was very cool and smooth and his models, he would never put heels on the models. And he would never pick like top models who had very recognizable features. Everybody kind of looked the same. He, he sort of molded them to the Armani look. And Versace, of course, was with the top models and Naomi Campbell and Christy Turlington and, and lots of high heels and very sexy, and very hot and very colorful. And, you know, he was playing big with the celebrities in Hollywood. And so he had a completely, you know, they were really uh, polar opposites in terms of how they interpreted fashion and what and what lifestyles they were representing. So, so the fashion that you wore or that appealed to you was very much indicative of a certain kind of a lifestyle. Okay, uh, that that's very interesting. I I don't remember the seventies uh, and seventies were very really little, but in the eighties, I can I could tell you could tell, yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. It was super interesting. So now I'm going to uh, pass the word to Professor Piredu, who has some questions for you, and then we'll uh, reunite all together uh, for more questions. Uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Nicoletta. Thank you, Donatella, and thank you, Sarah, for this wonderful overview. It reminds us about, yes, the padded shoulders. Yes, we all have a skeleton in the cupboard that I still have, a, <laughs> have a, but you know, luckily we are in a new millennium, but indeed. So it precisely following up on, on this uh, fantastic overview that has also pointed out uh, the extent to which the Made in Italy is not only one lifestyle. There are different models, different ways of identifying with what uh, the nation was producing. Maybe I would like to ask you uh, how, in your view, the image of the Made in Italy uh, changed in the last couple of decades uh, in terms, let's say, of message and also of reception. For instance, uh, what are the highlights uh, in, in this last 20 years, major changes, and also perhaps, in your view, the greatest challenge to Italian fashion? at present? So one of the things that became very clear to me as I was reporting on Italian fashion, so we're talking late 80s, 90s, early 2000s, was that it was basically supported by an industrial system that was unmatched anywhere else in the world. And so it wasn't just the designer at the top of you know, the system. It was all of the manufacturers. And I was covering the trade fairs. 
So I was going to the fabric shows. I was going to Pitti Uomo. I was going to Pitti Filati, which was the, the yarns. I mean, it started from the yarns. So people would go and, and buy the yarns and then the um, fabric you know, weavers would make the fabrics. And there was a lot of technology also being used in the development of these products. So there was experimentation um, at the levels of the yarns and how they were dyed, what um, fibers were, were um, spun together with them. So for example, they were experimenting with elastic. So to get stretch fabrics, they were experimenting with dyeing to get like all the different kinds of denim. They were experimenting with velvet and, and on and on and on. So there's this very rich um, industrial and production system that's filled with great you know, family businesses, passionate entrepreneurs, um, and, and really special products. So, so Italy became a place where buyers from brands all over the world would come to buy these products. And I think that really characterized this period from let's say the, the 80s to the you know, mid 2000s. And so made in Italy came to mean products that were made in this, in this you know, industrial, they called it the, the filatiera tessile. Um, Italiana. And that has pretty much come unraveled in the last 20 years. Um, maybe not 20 years, maybe the last 10, in the last decade, really, since I stopped covering fashion. And what we saw was um, there was a lot of know how being also put into um, manufacturers in Africa, in the Middle East, in India, in China, because you know, the cost of labor became very high, the cost of supplies became very high. So even the Italian companies themselves and then others were, were teaching um, other companies and other workers how to achieve higher level products. But the effect of that was that many of the Italian family businesses went out of business because they could no longer compete on price. And so what you saw was this very kind of concentrated um, landscape of suppliers became a global supply system. And so then you see companies like Prada, for example, going to Japan to buy their, their nylon, you know, for their backpacks and their um, outerwear. And, and so, so it became a system where the top brands would shop for the best product, you know, wherever it was in the world and it wasn't necessarily Italian. And so then the question became, well, how do you maintain a made in Italy label if it's not made in Italy anymore? Um, and so there was a lot of, of you know, writing in, in the late 90s and early 2000s about how these companies would, well, they would outsource, they would design it in Italy. So they, you'd have, you know, like, for, for example, companies like Geox, you know, they would say were designed in Italy, but they would be produced not too far away because they still got, you know, lower cost but quality production in Romania and in Eastern Europe. Um, you would have uh, products that would be practically assembled outside of Italy and then the last stitching or the last, you know, uh, finishing would be done in Italy so they would get to put the Italian um, label on it. But it was definitely um, a very radical change from, from the way the system had evolved um, after the war. There, there also became um, very important ethical issues that these companies had to address in terms of exploitation of labor. And, um, you know, you saw stories about, you know, exploiting, you know, workers in China where the labor laws weren't, say, as strict as in, in Italy. And so, you know, the, the big brands couldn't afford to have their names associated with, with poor, you know, um, exploitative labor practices. And so how are they going to do that? And then, and then you had the whole situation where you had Chinese um, people who immigrated from China settling in the Tuscany region around Florence. And you, they discovered, I think, you know, without realizing it, that they were actually sweatshops um, functioning you know right under their noses in their backyards and so um, Gucci for example created a whole system of certifying their supply chain along the way so that they could um, vouch for you know, not only the quality of the product but the ethics behind 
uh, the workmanship of the product. This is, uh, thank you for mentioning this. This is definitely uh, not just a problem of, uh, I would say, national identity sold with the idea of the made in Italy, but also an ethical concern, absolutely. You know, the moment you go uh, beyond the borders, uh, you are confronted, you know, with this difficult tension between uh, the local, the national, and the global. Uh, and so, um, yes, it's 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 not easy actually. I uh, maybe I can ask you this question right away because it's something that really you know it, it was in the back of my mind. But you have already prepared the ground for this. Now, I also with my class, I'm teaching. I was telling you a course uh, on the Made in Italy, and last week we watched the documentary, The True Cost, where absolutely you see uh, plenty of examples of what you have mentioned, right? So exploitation, um, obviously keeping the cost down. Uh, and, and squeezing the workers between uh, the, the prices at the end of, of the production chain when you want to sell. And uh, uh, but obviously the wages of the laborers are the, you know, the item that suffers the most. And so, you know, the, the, the human and environmental damage caused by fast fashion has been amply documented and also denounced. And indeed the, the very low prices of, of garments that result from exploitative outsourcing inflict in human working conditions upon laborers in developing countries. And so my curiosity, and in part you have mentioned Gucci, but I'm wondering whether this is the case for all the big brands. My, really, It's really a naive question. How do high-end fashion brands guarantee that the complete production chain does not suffer from the same exploitation? Meaning, is the high price of their products sufficient evidence that they do, that they care? Uh, because you know, I, I was I was watching um, interviews with um, representatives of human rights and legal rights offices, saying that when they tackle this issue of uh, protection of laborers with fast fashion, if they deal individually with specific brands, they may have a kind of informal assurance that there is a concern. But when this, the further step arrives, meaning can we prepare a document that has to be agreed upon by everybody so that this inhuman exploitation can be put to an end, then cooperation ends. So again, I'm, I'm repeating what I've seen in documentaries. So I'm wondering, what, what can you tell us about these high brands? <laughs> well, they've had to realize that they absolutely have to be on top of this issue and the price itself is not sufficient to guarantee. And like in the case of not only Gucci, but Chanel and other companies that were producing in Florence, you know, they, they realized that it wasn't just a matter of when they went to a foreign production um, location. There were, there were sweatshops literally proliferating right in front of their noses. And I actually, I have a, a, picked a painting on the back of my wall that was done by my sister who lived in Pistoia for many years. And um, this shows like the hills, the Apennini and the sort of the factory, you know, the factory areas in the outskirts of Pistoia. But she has another painting, which is a factory wall of a former, you know, small like light uh, industrial factory. And there's about a dozen mailboxes on the front of this wall that have cropped up, you know, in, in recent times. And you know, she did a little investigating. What she found out was that about a dozen Chinese families had moved into the factory and were living there and also working there. And these mailboxes, you know, were a sign that these families had all moved in. So it's also a story of, of migration and the movement of people you know, to find work and to find a, a different kind of kind of life. So, so I think all of these companies have had to um, become very active in certifying the you know ethical labor practices uh, behind their products. And I know more about the Gucci um, situation, but I think Louis Vuitton and Chanel and all of them have had to do the same. Um, they've also had to do a lot of work on fighting counterfeits, but that's a, that's a bit of a separate issue, but they've put a lot of, of resources into that. Um, and then in terms of the environmental um, issues, which as you said rightly are, are more uh, prevalent in fast fashion, but also are issues that the luxury brands have to address. And, and my observation was in the, you know, the years I stopped covering fashion in um, 2009. Um, and up until that point, 
there was not a huge amount of, of effort being put into these environmental issues. Um, there were some, I remember like Procter and Gamble was paying a lot of attention and they were doing things like replanting sandalwood forests after they had ex extracted sandalwood for their products or planting trees, you know, or doing things to try to balance. Um, and I do know that Francois-Henri Pinot, who currently is the head of the Caring Group, um, K-E-R-I-N-G, which owns Gucci, um, he actually wrote his company's social responsibility plan uh, before it even moved into luxury. It was, it was a, a company called PPR, and it was Printemps Redoute, which was the department store and the mid-tier retailer. And um, Gucci has gone on now under his direction to be very active in terms of environmental issues and social issues as well. So I think that that's indicative that these brands have realized that the quality and luxury also has to be equivalent to more moral and ethical and environmental practices. So, so it kind of, you know, they, they are, they have to go together. Otherwise, um, their brands will be destroyed and diminished um, because people, I don't think people will accept anything less anymore. Well, thank you. This is reassuring. Yes, mm -hmm. probably, yes, fashion is for a number of reasons at, at, at a turning point also in terms of social and racial justice, environmental justice. So we hope, uh, you know, it's such a powerful communication system. There is so much at stake in a variety of domains. So uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll... I know. mean, it's not, I mean, we still know that, you know, the textile industry and the dyeing industry are some of the most, you know, environmentally um, um, damaging. So... Mm -hmm. You know, by being attentive to it doesn't mean they're actually fixing every problem or solving every problem, but I think I think they've come a long way from where they were in terms of realizing these these issues need to be addressed and compensated for. Absolutely. And, you know, customers as well, also the, the awareness of customers when they step into, you know, a shop and they make a choice, uh, the choice uh, it's not just an individual one, but it has global repercussions. Um, a colleague of mine uh, who's based in Paris who has done a lot of really excellent reporting on, on these environmental issues. And her name is Dana Thomas. Okay. And she wrote a book about fast fashion and she's done several exposés. Um, and now she's starting with environmental um, podcasts. So I would urge you to definitely follow, follow her and um, and I could see if you know if you'd like her to come and speak with me, she might be willing to come and, and share her her observations. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> um, since you, we are revolving around uh, uh, you know these big companies, uh, uh, multi generational. Uh, families, multi-generational stories, the Gucci family, of which you're an expert, is a good example, and you know, to a certain extent uh, uh, is representative of uh, the evolution of Italian fashion. But in addition to Gucci, you have chronicled the explosion of other labels. We have mentioned Armani, Versace, Prada, Ferragamo, uh, from family atelier uh, into mega brands. And so I'm wondering whether you are willing to share uh, with our audience also some specific episodes or events that you consider somehow memorable or at least pivotal in the history of those labels and that make them unique? So I, when I saw that question, I thought a really interesting example is the example of Versace. So again, another family company. Uh, Gianni was the creative genius. He had his brother Santo, who was the businessman, and his sister Donatella, who was kind of the muse, but she also started designing the, the younger labels. And um, as you know, he was shot in 1997. So just two years after Maurizio Gucci was murdered, he was murdered in, in Miami. Um, it was a complete shock to, to everybody. There was a real crime story behind it. Um, but, and at that point he was already a mega brand. So it was a family run company, but it was already a very powerful and successful business. Um, but what was shocking to me, so I was reporting on the business side of fashion. And uh, so one of the things that I was reporting into was his, his will um, and his, how he had structured, you know, what was gonna happen to the company if anything happened to him. And the way he did it was very um, emotional. 
It was very much loving. He basically, he left um, 50% of the company to his niece, Allegra, who at the time was a minor. And he left all of his art and paintings to his nephew, Daniel. So these are the children of his sister, Donatella. Okay, so, you know, clearly had love for his family. He wanted his, his um, nipotini to, to have, you know, something. Um, but what that did was that it, because Allegra was a minor, it put any decisions about the expansion, you know, what they call in Italian, a uh, decisione straordinaria, so extraordinary decisions. So any decisions that would involve an investment over a certain amount of money or any major, you know, that was something beyond business as usual, then had to be reviewed by the juvenile judge who was overseeing uh, protecting Allegra's interests in the company. So this what ended up being incredibly complicated for a company that's trying to grow and trying to deal with the death of its founder. You know, Donatella was taking the reins, you know, she obviously huge emotional stress, but then also she had all of this, you know, business complexity that was a result of this inheritance, the way this inheritance is structured. And so I thought that was a very good example of uh, you know, how a family run company can really stunt its own growth if it doesn't get advice from experts and professionals that will allow it to expand. So this was a very extreme, extreme example. Um, and I think it's actually extraordinary what Donatella was able to go on to achieve because she, she was very determined and she, she really hung in there and she really kept the brand not only alive, but moving forward, you know, under her own vision, despite these, um, these hurdles, significant hurdles that she had. Thank you. That's, that's one example. Um, the other example I wanted to give, um, you know, I talk a lot in my book about this whole issue of generational um, change and how does, how does a family hand down, um, you know, a brand, a successful business from one generation to the next. And, you know, as we see in the case of, of the Gucci story, you know, it wasn't necessarily the case that Maurizio, who had the vision for uh, re, re, relaunching Gucci, actually had the, the, the business skills to do it. And, and he almost lost, you know, he almost ran Gucci into bankruptcy. And, you know, the decision about when do you bring in a CEO from outside, when do you have somebody in the family who can carry it forward? And you see this with, I don't know, with also companies like Luxoptica and Del Vecchio who passed the business on to his son. You see this with um, um, Maramotti and Max Mara who, who passed it on to Luigi. Um, you see it with uh, even Esse Lunga, the, the grocery store. Um, so um, in a case where I think that it worked very successfully is the case of the Zegna family. Ermene Gildo Zegna, who is the menswear fa uh, fashion brand, and they make very expensive men's and highly tailored men's suits. And they've managed to pass it down from the founder to the second generation, um, you know, with a lot of success because they had people, uh, one who could agree with each other, and two who had real, you know, business acumen and ability to, to operate on a on a global scale. So it wasn't just being able to run a family company. I mean, the people who were able to make this generational leap in this last era were the ones who could, who could navigate a global a market. And we talked a little bit before about how sourcing has become global. So it's both you know, production and also distribution and setting up a, a you know, global store network and, and then also hiring managers who can run, run that. So it, it requires many, different skill sets. Definitely. And, you know, hiring managers from outside who are able to step into the history of the family also. You know, we were studying also the, the attempt uh, of Pucci uh, at rebranding and the major setbacks because people only jumped in with a kind of entrepreneurial spirit, but lacking the ability to interpret the story of the family. So the story was not there, a kind of authenticity uh, that uh, somehow 
paid homage to tradition without being stuck only in the past, that that continuity was missing. So certainly, you know, the Made in Italy is made of this, uh, I would say, tension between tradition and innovation. It's Absolutely. something that is not present in other, uh, maybe national uh, productions. I don't want to sound nationalistic here. I'm just uh, interpreting you know, this precarious balance uh, that the, the, the label is trying to, to convey. Uh, I am happy to give the floor back to Donatella, not Versace, but Melucci, uh, <laughs> who will ask. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicoletta. Uh, Sara, your, uh, uh, your information are absolutely um, very important for us, and, uh, um, uh, and it, this is really precious for us uh, to, to hear uh, about uh, Italian fashion. Um, so um, I uh, let me let me tell the audience so that if they want they can write a question and answers uh, in the Q and A section and we'll try to answer at the end of this webinar um, and uh, um, then I would like to ask you you know you know I read the book I read interviewed you in other occasions uh, and uh, I, and for this I want to thank the Italian Cultural Society for introducing us. And uh, uh, is also a co-host of this uh, of this event. Uh, but what I know the answer, but we want to hear from you. Uh, uh, so you can share it with everybody. Who prompted you to write? What prompted you to write the House of Gucci uh, book? Uh, it's a bestseller. Uh, it's a beautiful chronicle of uh, the Gucci saga, the Gucci family. Beautifully written. Uh, it's hard to put it down. I uh, I read it. It's big. It's a big book. Uh, it's like about from 500 pages, but you read it in a breeze, like because it's again, it's beautifully written. What well, prompted to write that? Well, thank you for those words. Well, I I knew I wanted to write a book, and I was a beat reporter for Women's Wear Daily, but I was covering the business side of fashion in those years, and I couldn't figure out what I was going to write about until I realized that after six years covering Gucci, I really had deep knowledge of the company and its history and its struggles um, to move forward. And the person who really inspired me to write the book was Maurizio Gucci himself, who was the last Gucci to run the company. And I had been to his first press conference in Milan in 1991. Um, and the fancy new headquarters that he had just reopened and just a few steps from La Scala Opera House. And that's where he talked about with such passion about his vision to relaunch Gucci to be, you know, the glory um, of it, uh, what it had had in the years of his father and his grandfather. And he wanted to make it a uh, top level brand um, on par with Hermes of France. So he really felt Italy needs to have its own Hermes and it should be Gucci. And then I covered you know, all of his struggles to do that and his failure to do that and his loss of the company in 1993, his murder in 1995, and then the arrest of his ex-wife Patrizia Rajani in 1997. And it was a very tragic story. And I wasn't thinking of it as a book until later in 1997, the company under Tom Ford and Domenico De Sole started to take off. And, and you know, at one point when Maurizio was struggling to hold on to it, he was saying to his shareholder, just give me six months and the Japanese are gonna see that Gucci is a new Gucci and they're gonna come back and the wind is gonna be in our sails. And he never got the chance to do that. But sure enough, six months later, the company took off and the sales were, you know, I just recently interviewed Domenico De Sole again, and he reminded me of that period. The sales were doubling like every few months. Um, it was a phenomenal success. They, they staged the most successful IPO in the history of fashion. Uh, Investcor got more than $2 billion, you know, paying over many times what their initial investment had been in Gucci. So at that point, I said, you know, if this is a rise and fall and rise again story, but Maurizio was the connection between the past and the future. And even though he couldn't succeed himself, he laid the vision. And I thought it was important to cement his legacy as the one who had the vision and who started cleaning up the market so that Gucci could then be a top level brand again. 
Thank you very much. Nicoletta, do you want to go ahead, go ahead with your question, another question? Sure, thank you. Maybe let's draw from uh, from the Q and A resource here. For okay. instance, uh, you know, tying up with what we have said so far, um, some people um, notice that uh, uh, we mentioned brands where women were prominent, right? And so the question would be, uh, you know, how about the importance of women in Italian fashion? Is there anything we can say? And at the same time, also thinking of luxury products uh, uh, in connection with young generations, what is the future of luxury products uh, in your view when we're thinking of, you know, younger people? Where is the trend? So maybe you your experience will uh, allow us to understand more. <laughs> great, great question. I mean, there were very important women in, in the history of Italian fashion, obviously, that we mentioned um, Schiaparelli and Le Sorelle Fontane, but also in later years, there was Crizia, which was Mariuccia Mandelli. That was a huge brand. Um, there were very strong women in the family companies. So there was Rosita Missoni, who's still um, you know, with us today, and then her daughter Angela, still in the company today. There were the Sorelle Fendi in Rome. They were furriers, started out as furriers. Um, there was Vanda Ferragamo, who continued the Ferragamo company even after Salvatore um, passed. Um, and, and also a very, I think, instrumental and influential woman is Miucha Prada who, you know, with, you know, again, we see these teams, you know, so it was, you know, Mandelli and Aldo Pinto. Um, um, and in the case of Prada, it was, it was Miucha Prada, who had started, you know, as an intellectual, as a, you know, young girl cutting out of school in, in Milan, and then ended up taking over her family company and with her husband, Patrizio Bertelli. Um, uh, but the creativity of Miucha was, was really exceptional and really, you know, allowed that brand to be as, as, as strong as it, as it was and it still is. Um, in terms of youth, I think that is a very interesting question because, of course, all of these brands are hungry for getting young consumers. And, and I'm thinking about also like the technology companies. I mean, I've been reporting on, on Facebook and one of Facebook's existential um, crises right now is that young people are not going to Facebook. They're, they're going to other other platforms. Um, and yet the last time I interviewed Francois Henri Pinot about Gucci, he said one of the things that they're seeing with the designs of Alessandro Michele is that they're really for the first time attracting younger customers. And that's what they all want because the idea is they wanna get you in when you're young and then they wanna keep you as you get older and, and, and in theory, you know, wealthier so that you can buy more. Um, but how do young people have the money to afford these products? Um, you know, is it, you know, in the days of Dawn Mello, she used to skip lunch, you know, so she could save her lunch money and buy her, her first Gucci hobo bag. Um, is that what young people are doing today? I think that's maybe, maybe we can get some comments <laughs> from our, from our audience. And, and when do you invest in technology, which I think you have to have, right? You have to have your phone and your ear pods, um, really, you know, your, your iPads, your computers. When do you invest in technology and when do you invest in fashion? We have another question that uh, I, one of our students is asking, what is your favorite moment in history of fashion and why? Well, I think for me, since I covered it, um, the favorite moment was those early days of covering the, the fashion shows in Milan and sort of discovering this world and the passion and the magic of the runway show, because these, these brands, in order to get people to buy, you know, what are basically handbags and shoes, mostly, um, they create a dream for us. And the runway shows were, you know, over and over again, this creation of, of dream scenarios where you can envision yourself uh, wearing those clothes and being that person. And I was just fascinated with the, the creativity. They were always tapped into the latest music, the latest movies. It was kind of like a zeitgeist. It was a way to have your finger on the pulse of, of pop culture in that moment. Um, and yet at the same time, as I was saying earlier, I knew that there was this very um, solid and impressive industrial system behind it. So I felt like I was able to see the whole, um, 
you know, the whole pipeline from like the, literally like I went to, I remember going to a factory in the Veneto where they had just brought the wool in from Australia from the sheep and you could smell the sheep and they were in the process of washing and carding and then spinning the wool. So I felt like I was able to, to see like the whole circle of the process from that wool that was coming in off of ships to the Armani jacket, you know, on the runway. Nicoletta, do you want to look at another question or one of yours? No, no, the, the, since we mentioned earlier also the environmental impact and, and the ethical concerns about, uh, you know, uh, the production of, of clothing and the involvement of luxury brands, there's a question in uh, here in the Q&A about uh, the efforts of luxury brands when it comes to sustainability. So what is your predictions of how this issue will shape the future? Um, well, I think, you know, we've seen a bit uh, along the way, we've seen designers like Stella McCartney, who, who have, you know, no, um, no leather, no animal based products, and, and she was a real pioneer in that. Um, that was not really a big movement in the fashion industry. Um, but now more and more, you're seeing things marked eco, marked sustainable. Um, so my prediction is that, that it's going to become even more important for consumers to know that what, what we buy is ecological and sustainable. Um, and I think, that, I think the companies need to do more and need to work faster on these issues. But, but I think consumers can also really send a message too. Um, so it's not only up to the companies. I think if consumers you know, vote, as they say, with their pocketbooks, um, that will send a very strong message to these companies. We have uh, uh, just a few more minutes. Uh, uh, maybe we can fit another question from the Q and A. So, Nicoletta, what do you think? Sure, sure, definitely. Yes, uh, so we have uh, we have a question. I I, I read as they uh, it's written. Uh, so years ago, while in Rome, I was told that Italy was uh, uh, was bringing a lot of Chinese workers or backing back, back to the issue of immigration, et cetera. Uh, so Chinese workers uh, to live and work uh, in Italy to create garments. Uh, this way, Italy could keep uh, uh, its uh, Made in Italy label while using foreign labor. Uh, can you confirm this or give uh, the correct version? Thank you. Yeah, so absolutely, I, I can confirm it and, and say this was, you know, I saw it with my own eyes. My sister painted <laughs> the mailboxes on the factory wall. Um, there were many articles written about this um, at the time. Um, but it, just because there were you know, non-Italians working the factories didn't mean that that was legal. And so there was a big push to, to legalize, um, you know, the, these workshops and this employment and make sure that these workers were getting the Italian benefits, they were, you know, documented um, that it wasn't just uh, uh, like a, a, you know, an industry, a sweatshop industry that was running, um, you know, under under the, the guise of, of uh, under the, you know, illegally. Um, so yes, I think it, it's true that it was, it was happening. It's true that it was a hurdle that these companies had to deal with, but that they were addressed. As far as I know, you know, they did fix these issues. Thank you. Nicoletta, do you have other questions? Yes, maybe, I don't know to what extent uh, our audience uh, uh, is thinking about, uh, um, yes, the, the location of, uh, of Italian fashion. Or when we think of France, uh, we think of Paris. Uh, when we think of fashion in Italy, we think of also across the history of, of the phenomenon, we think of multiple Italian cities, right? There were moments when Rome, um, Donatella mentioned the La Dolce Vita earlier, so where Rome and cinema uh, work together to give a certain image of Italian fashion. Florence had its time and still has landmarks of um, the history of Italian fashion, Milan, pret a -Porte, the Fashion Week. So in your view, what is the role that these three cities play in, in the current fashion panorama? Do you think that each of them has a specific approach to fashion and a role to play in fashion? Or do you see them more as interchangeable right now? 
No, yeah, not interchangeable at all. I think they they each played a, a specific role and, and, and great question. And I would say that you know Milan is now recognized as the fashion capital of Italy. And for many years, it was kind of in, in competition with Paris as to who, you know, which city was the fashion capital. And, and the way the shows rotated, it was you know, New York, London, um, Paris, Milan, or Milan, Paris. And depending on how much the journalists and the buyers liked the shows in either Paris or Milan, you know, they would vie for which was, which was really kind of the city that had the, the co that commanded the beating heart of fashion. Um, I think Florence was an earlier period um, and it was a big center in the 80s also for the Pitti Imagine trade shows and that they did a fantastic job with both the Pitti Uomo and the Pitti Bimbo. So they had children's fashion, Pitti Filati and uh, that attracted both companies and buyers from all over the world. Um, but it wasn't so much a sort of ready to wear, you know, extravaganza the way the Milan shows were, you know, and, and as you said, Milan had wrested the, the, the Sala Bianca, the fashion shows, the Prata Pote away from Giorgini and really, you know, took it, took it forward um, in the 80s. So, um, and then Rome uh, was the heart of the couture, the Alta Moda. So, Rome was more associated with, uh, for example, Valentino uh, was based in Rome and his couture was, was shown in Rome and it was a big drama. Um, I remember you know, Women's Were Dating was writing about it when, when Valentino decided he was going to leave Rome and show his couture in Paris. So there you get the tension also between uh, Alta Moda, Rome and couture, haute couture in, in Paris. Um, but say today, um, you know, Rome, I don't think is as much of a factor in the fashion world, but you have Alessandro Michele, who is the designer of, of Gucci, who, who lives in Rome and his, his, his studio is in Rome. And if people want to go and have meetings with him, they often meet him in Rome. So, so there's, still, uh, there's still a role for Rome to play. And as, as you said, it's still the, the heart of, of Cina Chita, and that's actually where the House of Gucci movie was filmed. And many of the scenes that were supposed to be in Milan were actually filmed in Rome because the whole infrastructure for filming is much more efficient in Rome. So you have like the scene where Adam Driver is riding his bicycle up to his, his office where he's shot. And I'm, I'm watching it for the first time and thinking, well, that's not Milan. Where is that? And because I know that it's not Milan. And that scene was actually filmed in Rome, even though it was supposed to be set in Milan. So, so you have the cinema also playing a role here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It was a very informative uh, webinar. I, I loved the information you gave us. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, for uh, taking the time to, to, to talk to us and tell us about your expertise or what you know about Italian fashion. Uh, I want to thank the Department of Italian and Georgetown University, of course, at Georgetown University, the Italian Cultural Society who gave us uh, the, this connection between us and uh, Sara, Professor Esmond Nicoletta Pireddu, who was wonderful as usual. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, the audience uh, enjoyed, I'm sure they did. Uh, the questions were very nice. Uh, and uh, thank you all, and uh, hopefully we'll meet again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Feel free to follow me on my Instagram at Sarah Gay Forden. I'm telling little backstories about the writing of the book if people want to know more. Okay, that's great. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Thank you to both of you and to the audience. Bye-bye. Thanks.